Okay, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to read the question prompt. Which choice best describes data that weakens the team's hypothesis? So I need to use the data to strengthen or weaken, in this case, weaken the team's hypothesis. So I'm going to read the passage and make sure I understand and underline what that hypothesis is. So in the United States, firms often seek incentives from municipal governments to expand to those municipalities. Okay, so companies want to go to towns. Okay, a team of political scientists hypothesized that municipalities are much more likely to respond to those firms and offer incentives if expansions can be announced in time to benefit local elected officials than if they can't. Okay, so the town will in turn actually respond. And they could respond either way. They'll actually respond positively or just respond if it occurs in time. That is before the actual elected official leaves. So the incentive would be for the official to benefit from that is the idea. The team contacted officials in thousands of municipalities inquiring about incentives for a firm looking to expand and indicating that the firm would announce its expansion on a date either just before or just after the next election. Okay, so the hypothesis is if you do it before the election, then more likely that that town's going to respond or respond positively in time. Let's see what data is indicated in the graph. So most municipalities don't even respond. And that doesn't differ between whether the announcement's before or after the election. In theory, if the hypothesis were true, the number of responses or no responses would be much less for the before the election. And the offered incentives would be much higher than for before the election. <clears throat> or alternatively, we could say the responded to inquiry would be higher before the election. So the light and dark bars are about the same for every area when they should be differing. So that's what we're going to see. Actually, the fact that they're the same is a problem that weakens the argument. There's no difference between before or after responses or offering incentives. A large majority of the municipalities that received an inquiry mentioning plans for an announcement before the next election didn't respond. So that didn't respond was the biggest bar, but that's not the idea. I want the difference between the before and the after bar sizes for each of the cases. B, the proportion of municipalities that responded to the inquiry or offered incentives, this is the key issue that's in the theory, it should increase if it's before, didn't substantially differ across the announcement timing, but it should have. If they were before the next election announced, those should be more likely to offer incentives and get a response. So the fact that they didn't is weakening the argument. I think that's going to be correct. B. Let's just check C and D. Only half the municipalities responded to inquiries mentioning plans for an announcement before the next election. No, the actual absolute number doesn't say anything to their claim. Of the municipalities that received an inquiry mentioning plans for an announcement date after the next election, more than 1,200 didn't respond, only 100. Again, I have no basis of comparison here, so that doesn't help me determine the claim. B is the correct answer. Nope, there's always a core idea. You know, it's this versus that. Whatever the core idea is from the text, you and especially the graph too, you need to pick up that idea. Sometimes the words, the graph, maybe even the wording can make it unclear. When it's unclear, the problem's going to become hard no matter what. So you have to read carefully and sort of formulate yourself. What is the idea here that's going on? Okay, let's read the question first. Which choice best describes data from the table that supports, so this is strength and weakens, this one supports ego and colleagues assertion. So let's read and figure out what that assertion is. To assess the impact of invasive species on ecosystems in Africa, ego and colleagues review government reports from those nations about how invasive species are undermining ecosystem services, aspects of the ecosystem on which residents depend. 
Okay. The services were sorted into three categories, provisioning material resources from the ecosystem, regulating natural processes and cultural non-material benefits. Ego and her team asserted that the countries in each region reported effects on provisioning services and that provisioning services, which is this, represent the majority of reported services. So, okay, which describes and it supports her to the table should show me that provisioning services are the majority. Well, they are, they're far more than regulating cultural. They're all over 50% with one exception. That's the only exception, but the overall number is still well over 50%. So I think that's the supporting data. Let's see the answer choices. A, provisioning services represent 73% of the services reported for the West region, 33% for Central, but 75% of overall. Okay, so they're telling me it's this, this, and overall this. Okay, possibly. Why only two regions, though? So let's keep looking. None of the percentages shown for provisioning services are lower than 33%. And the overall percentage for provisional services is 75%. So this is saying there is only one or none of them are below a third. And the overall average is well above half, which is our level four majority condition, which is what it says. That's 50%, our majority condition. So that seems to be talking overall. Yeah, I think that's better. There's no need to assess individual regions. C. Provisioning services are shown for each region while no cultural services. No, that has nothing to do with finding the majority. D, the greatest percentage shown for provisioning services is 88 for the north, and the least is 33, but that says nothing of the overall average. We want to basically find or assert that countries in each region offered effects on provisioning services that represent the majority of the reported services. And that's generally true. According to the table, there's one exception b is going to be the answer again the problem with a is why do we pick out this particular one right and the purpose of this one is that it's the lowest so it's gotten a lower than that and that's really not too far away from 50 percent in its own right okay this also has the 75 percent overall but this is shown here in b as well b is the better answer note the difference here between the answer that's broadly showing from the lowest to the average versus the answers that have some specifics, there's no particular reason to choose those specific regions, which really makes those answers wrong for the core idea. Which choice best describes data from the table that support the underlying claim? Okay, so we need to look at the underlying claim and we need to support it. The claim is a divided Congress may be a necessary but not sufficient condition for a decrease in government size to occur. So let's read this. Economist Hanke has shown that a divided U.S. Congress, which occurs only when one party holds the majority in the House and another holds the majority in the Senate, tend to accompany reductions in total federal outlays. So divided equals reduced federal outlays relative to GDP. That's probably what our chart is. And it's percentage changes of federal outlays relative to GDP. Okay, and we've got divided versus undivided. I think I'm understanding the graph here. Hanke has pointed out to his calculations evidence that a divided Congress may be necessary but not sufficient. So let's see. If, according to his point or the theory, that divided means we should have all negatives, okay, overall. It never really says the breakout defense, non defense. I'm not sure if that's even important here. But divided, okay, it tends to two out of three times it's down, okay? If it's undivided, 100% of the time it's up. It's always up, okay? So what does that mean? If you're not divided, you're undivided, you're never going to go down. Is essentially what's going on here. And if you are divided, you may, you're likely to go down, but you may or may not go down. So I think that's really what our necessary but not sufficient condition means. It's a little tricky. So necessary but not sufficient means we may or may not go down if it occurs. It might not be sufficient, 
on a divided Congress. In other words, you can have a divided Congress and still go up. But if you have an undivided Congress, you don't have that, that division in place, you definitely will not go down. You have to go up. And that's what the data shows. So let's see what the answer is. A, the periods of undivided Congress were associated with increases in non-defense. No, it's not about non-defense. I want total outlays. B, all the periods of divided Congresses were associated with reductions. No, that's not true. Just false. There is a period where we went down on total outlays with a divided Congress. Or we went up, I should say. 75 to 76. So that's not correct. C. The periods of undivided Congresses were associated with increases in total outlays. Okay. That's true. Whereas all the periods of divided Congresses were associated with reductions. In non-defense or defense, no, that's not true. And they weren't all down. All the periods of divided Congresses, except one, two out of three, yep, were associated with reductions. So we probably have reductions, but not all the time. Whereas the periods of undivided Congress were associated with increases. So if it was not divided, they were always up. You could not go down. That's the idea, necessary but not sufficient. So interesting condition, a little tricky there. Uh, looks like D is going to be the answer here. That's probably a hard one for most students. Okay, which choice most effectively uses data from the table to complete the statement? Okay, so we have to complete the statement. Let's take a look. So remember, our answer choices always have to be for this true to the table, but also relevant. They have to be answering the question or the issue at hand here. So let's take a look. In Caddo, a language from what is now the U.S. Southeast, vocabulary pertaining to corn cultivation resembles equivalent vocabulary to a Mexican family. This resemblance, perhaps attributable to cultural context, such words have, could have entered Caddo, through the intermediary of the neighboring but unrelated Chitimacha language. So Chitimacha, Caddo are related and they both seem to have origin from the Mexican language. So we have kind of Mexican language here and it moved up into the Southeast with the corn and the language followed. So the language, the references to the corn were very much in line with the Mexican uses of the word, if I understand this correctly, okay? That the vocabulary pertaining to domestic crops accompanies them as they diffuse in new regions established phenomenon globally. Crops may also be decoupled from vocabulary altogether. So wait, what's going on here? This is our premise to the conclusion that we have to fill in the blank of. Crops may be decoupled from vocabulary. So this shows a coupling, coupled. That is language and crops, okay? However, they might be decoupled from vocabulary. Corn cultivation became ubiquitous, which means it was everywhere among Southeastern tribes, yet, okay, so they all have corn in the Southeast, but these guys have a different language. These guys have a different language, not related to the Mexican, and the words are different. They're not cas cas, they're tan chi tan, and they seem to be related to themselves too. So maybe the vocabulary among Southeast the vocabulary is different for different tribes that didn't, you know, diffuse. So the vocabulary is decoupled from the crops. Or, well, the crops may be decoupled from vocabulary altogether. So what's the idea here? The origins of vocabulary pertaining to the crop vary across languages in the region. So the origins, yes, we've got some who have origins with the Mexican, some who don't. With the words for corn in Cherokee, which don't have the Mexican origin, and Muscogean up here, they 
don't have the Mexican origin, showing no demonstrable relationship to the Mexican vocabulary. Yes, that's right. That's true. Is it actually relevant? I think it is relevant. It's showing that the names of the crops are different, decoupled from the other groups where corn was, you know, diffusing through the culture. This didn't come the same way, so it was named differently, right? So corn exists here too, but the language itself for corn is decoupled, or the vocabulary is decoupled. So I think that's answering the conditions. Crops may also be decoupled from vocabulary. Yes, that shows crops, the same crop. It's decoupled from the vocabulary. It's in the Southeast, but it's not the same vocabulary. I think this is going to be our answer. This is kind of a tricky condition. We have to read it carefully. All the different names. It's hard to follow. B, the region is linguistically diverse, being home not only to Chitimachincado, but also to one. It's not about the region being linguistically diverse. The relationship is between the crops and the vocabulary being decoupled, not the same everywhere. Corn related vocabulary underwent changes when entering other unrelated languages as can be seen by the divergence of the Caddo word from the Chidi Macha word it originated. The Chaddo and the Chidi Macha words are pretty much the same. That's not the right answer. They're both Kas and Kasma. Let's look at D. Words for the corn in the language of the Muscogean family evolved from a common root, with the Muscogee having word, having lost certain consonant sounds still present in the Chicksaw and Chuck words. So this is focusing solely on the Muscogee and the different families within the Muscogee tribe. And it's saying the words in that language evolved from a common root. Well, they're similar to each other, so it makes sense they're a common root. But what does that say about our question? This is true, but I think it's not relevant to the question at hand, which is how crops may be decoupled from vocabulary. This shows within a different family a coupling of vocabulary, but the family itself is decoupled from the Mexican versions of corn in the language. So this is not right. It's true to the table, it's just not relevant to answering our question. A is the correct answer here.